you're all very welcome here this afternoon for um, our Open Geoscience talk. Um, before I introduce Eva properly, I'd just like to say a little bit about the Applied Mineralogy Group. So we are a special interest group of the Mineralogical Society. Um, we organize things such as these Open Geoscience talks, and we have a, a bulletin that we provide to our members or is available also through MINSOC. We organize lots of different types of workshops and we have bursaries. So please just check out our, our web pages on MINSOC. I'll put all the links in the chat um, as we go along. Um, our next Open Geoscience talk, just as a quick, um, a quick uh, introduction, will on, be on the 27th of, of May, which is a Thursday again at three o'clock GMT. And that will be Dr. Dave McNamara, who will also be talking on the theme of geothermal, but we don't quite have uh, the full title yet. Um, uh, too too advanced already. Um, so with that, Eva, I'm going to stop sharing. If you'd like to, if you'd like to share, and I'll, I'll start your introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I actually I cannot share my screen. Yeah. Ah, always a technical. Would you make me the presenter or? Oh, did you get dropped off as a presenter? Apologies. Um, so Eva is still a co-host. Um, <laughs> we literally tested this like I'm five trying, minutes ago. <laughs> I'm trying to do it, but I'm not allowed. Okay, so let me just try again. Best laid plans and all that. How about now, Eva? No? No, unfortunately not. Uh, sorry for that. Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, so I'll just give you a brief introduction if that's okay. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, we are delighted today to have uh, Professor Eva Hartai. Uh, Eva is a, a geologist um, who has an MSc from, oh my goodness, I'm going to absolutely ruin these pronunciations, uh, from Budapest. <laughs> and a PhD from the Budapest University. And Perfect. Thank you very much. And a PhD from Technical University in Kosic in Slovakia. Right. And she is a Euro, uh, Euro geol title holder since 2009. Uh, her research area is mostly ore geology and mineral resources, and she has more than 80 scientific publications. Eva has more than 40 years of teaching experience, leading courses in physical geology, environmental geology, and geology of mineral deposits. She was the editor in chief of the European Geologist Journal for nine years a coordinator of the EFG panel of experts on education for eight years. And Eva has taken part in several EU funded and national projects as coordinator or work package leader. And today we're delighted to have Eva with us to present her results of the uh, CHIMP project, which is the Combined Heat and Metal Production 2030, of which I was a team member as well as many other people on this talk. And with that, Eva, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. So uh, I, I see that uh, many of you or some of you will be familiar with the topic I, I will present, but uh, for whom who uh, are not familiar, I would like to uh, uh, tell you that uh, I will present today uh, potential utilization of deep metal enrichment, we, uh, which cannot be mined, uh, cannot be exploited because they are too deep. They are below the level of the traditional mining. So uh, actually this is the so-called CHPM project, CHPM 2030 project. The acronym comes from combined heat power and metal extraction from ultra deep ore bodies. And the number indicates the year by which we plan uh, the first pilots. Uh, this is uh, the content of my presentation. 
first uh, I will provide uh, some project facts, then I will speak about the research concept, the main outcomes, the main research results, and shortly about the research roadmap. And the uh, uh, photo illustrates that all, uh, although we worked hard in this project, sometimes we enjoyed life because this picture was taken in January 2019. Uh, uh, in fact, one of the partners, La Palma Research Center, is located in the Canary Islands and they organize this workshop in Gran Canaria. So if you think that it's hot summer, no, it was in January. But when, when at the very beginning, when we started to, to find out the research concept or the project idea, uh, this is general that that we uh, all, um, we always face a challenge. Uh, in our case, actually, it was a double challenge. One challenge is that uh, there is an increasing demand for the green energy in EU, not only in the EU worldwide. And uh, as the green energy, geothermal energy is an option, including EGS, because it is available anywhere. And the other, but the problem with it that the EGS technology is too expensive for the moment. Uh, the other challenge is that the EU needs the critical raw materials and the strategic raw materials for the technology development. But the mining in, uh, in Europe is very limited and there is a high import dependency on this strategic raw materials. That's why we found out a concept which combines the geothermal energy production with metal mining and planned to create a proof of the concept at uh, the economy of this uh, economic feasibility of this concept at a laboratory case, laboratory scale. I would underline this, that lab, lab scale. So we, we haven't uh, produced any pilot or any higher level uh, results. So I mentioned EGS, enhanced geothermal systems. Uh, it's really a risky business uh, in several aspects because there are risks from the exploration phase, then during the operation, and there are environmental, financial risks, a risk of social acceptance. So, uh, what I um, would underline again that there was a uh, that the strategic research and innovation in the strategic research and innovation agenda by the uh, European Technology and Innovation Platform on Deep Geothermal in uh, 2019, they defined that one potential means of cost reduction for geothermal resources is also the co-production of metals and non-metallic material contained in the geothermal fluids in addition to thermal and electrical energy. Based on that, we formulated the research concept. First, we identify ultra deep metalliferous formations. In the proposal and during the project, we used the term ore body, but then we changed it and used metal enrichments because ore body has some economic aspects. So it's better to, and, and actually, what we are looking for, these are low grade large tonnage masses, so better to use metal enrichments. So identify the deep metal and how deep? We have to reach the temperature which is needed for electricity production. So it means that we have to reach at least 150 centigrade. We, go, we, we have to go down to four kilometers or even deeper, depends on the given geothermal gradient. So ultra deep, when we use this term ultra deep, 
be mean at least four kilometers depth. And we establish an EGS system on this identified metal enrichment. We enhance the fracture systems within the ore body, leach the metals, and from the outcoming fluid, we extract metals and produce heat and electricity. Uh, and we hope that this technology makes the deep geothermal energy production financially more feasible and the earlier return of investment. Uh, this research concept is visualized here, what I, what I said before. We start from here. This is the injection well. We inject water with some additives. I would like to emphasize again here that we, we do mild leaching. So we, know, we cannot use any kind of aggressive uh, chemicals. So uh, injection fluid, which goes through the fractured ore body, heats up and dissolve, dissolves matters. The hot fluid comes out. Uh, first, we make an electrolytic matter recovery at high pressure, high temperature, 100 or above centigrade and, and 300 pressure. And then the fluid goes to the normal system, produce uh, electricity and even heating. When it comes back, uh, I would like to tell you here that we didn't consider this part of the technology. So we, we didn't deal with the electri electricity production or how the, the heating system works. We focused on these technology units. So when from the heating, the fluid comes back, it is about at a temperature of 50 centigrade. This is where the second step matter recovery takes place. And uh, this uh, technology is the so-called gas diffusion, electroprecipitation and electrocrystallization. When the fluid comes out from this technological units, it is about uh, 40 centigrade warm. And this is the finer technological unit, which is an additional uh, electricity production. This is the salt gradient power, genera uh, power generator. And uh, what, uh, the, this, this is a closed system, a closed loop. But you can see some water here uh, indicated. This is because fresh water is needed for this, uh, for this reverse electrodialysis uh, heat uh, uh, electricity production, but the fresh water moves in a separate system. So actually the, the fluid, the hydrothermal fluid moves in a closed system. And the same is explained here, but uh, more focus on the temperature changes, but I don't already mentioned that we start from a fluid which is about 150 centigrade and the final, at the final stage after using it for additional electricity production, the temperature is about 40 centigrade. The consortium involved 12 partners from 10 countries. Uh, they, we, we had three universities, uh, two from Hungary, uh, Miskolc University, this is my institution, and uh, two from Hungary and uh, one from Belgium, this is Catholic University Leuven. 
we had in the consortium five geological surveys from Iceland, UK, Portugal, uh, Romania, and Sweden. And we also had a Europe-wide professional organization. This is European Federation of Geologists. And two SMEs, one already was mentioned, the La Palma Research Center and uh, MIMPOR from Austria. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and other kinds of visualization, but I wouldn't go into details now. But in the followings, I would like to speak about the main research results. First, about the, about the literature uh, review of the potential sites and the identification of the later pilot sites. Then uh, uh, about the laboratory tests on metal leaching, the metal recovery in two steps. Uh, some words about the system integration and the research roadmap. Uh, first, we made a thorough literature work, a literature research. We uh, reviewed the metallogenic birds in Europe and also tried to find out the most appropriate settings which can be relevant uh, for, for this uh, technology. Uh, we also made some uh, we also made some uh, mineralogical geochemical examinations on selected samples. There were about 30 samples from the four potential uh, pilot sites. And uh, we, uh, within this work package, we also identified the knowledge gaps with the complete European re review. All of these reports are available on the project website. So even if the project ended, the website is, uh, still works. So if you are interested, you can visit and, and you will see these reports. Uh, just to back to this point, the, the most appropriate, the appropriate geological settings First, the magmatic hydrothermal mineralizations, which are associated with intrusive bodies, because these intrusive bodies in general have very good mechanical properties for the technology. For the second, the basins in the rift zones or subduction zones, these are relatively thin horizons, but Large, with large lateral extensions, so it is good for the leaching process. And the deep rooted fault zones with larger extension and elevated heat flow. Uh, in these zones, we uh, in general can find a deep, fertile rock body, which can be the, the base for the potential leaching. I mentioned that we identified four pilot sites. Actually, you will see that it is five, but we always mention four because two uh, belong to the same country. So the first uh, potential pilot site is Southwest England, Cornwall. Uh, why, why is it good? Because, uh, because uh, the geothermal conditions are very good. You know that even there are running geothermal projects, very rich mineralization, historical mining, and due to the historical mining, there is a high social acceptance. Which, also, which is also an aspect. So uh, there is a detailed study about all aspects, including geology, mineralization, uh, geothermal condition, 
uh, conditions, 3D modeling, 4D modeling, anything, there is a detailed report on that, which is also available on the Twitter website. I will refer back to this report, to these reports later. Uh, so the second potential test site is in the Iberian Pyrite Belt uh, in Port Portugal. It's Neves Corvo mine. Uh, why was it selected? Again, good geothermal conditions, very rich mineralization, volcanic massive sulfide mineralization. Uh, mining goes down to about 1,000 meters, but there are, uh, there are deeper drill holes down to two, two kilometers. Uh, we have a, a lot of data, a wide knowledge about it, uh, a lot of geological information, geophysical information, and what is also important, the management of the mining company is very cooperative. So they would be willing to, to cooperate if, if a CHPN plant would be established there. Third site is in Romania. This is the Bayush Basin and the Bihor Mountains. Uh, again, high geothermal gradient, elevated heat flow, good geothermal conditions. And in the uh, bonatitic, magmatic and metallogenic bed, there are rich mineralizations, mostly scarn mineralizations, which is very good because scarns in general are really fractured systems. So, uh, scar mineralization, so everything is, is very favorable for the establishment uh, of a pilot, a later pilot. The four, as the fourth site, we have two. These two sites uh, were selected by our partner, the Swedish Geological Survey. Uh, they, there are two locations. Uh, this is uh, Kristineberg in the Skellefteå district and the uh, Nautonen area in the northern Norrbotten region. Here we have a, a volcanic massive type uh, deposit and the other one is an iron oxide copper gold deposit. So rich mineralization. Uh, a lot of uh, exploration data, including deep seismic uh, magnitude telluric uh, data. So the data availability is really good. What is different from the other sites is that the geothermal gradient is very low here. So we have to go down to six to, to seven kilometers in order to, to reach the uh, needed temperature. Sorry, something happened to the laser pointer, but it's okay now. Uh, beside uh, these four uh, sites, potential pilot sites, we also made a, a, a European overview uh, by the help of the national member associations of the European Federation of Geologists, which participated in the project as linked third parties. And uh, they collected data uh, in their countries, collected data on, uh, on the geothermal potential and the deep metal enrichments of their countries really a huge amount of data, of data because they covered 24 countries. So from not, not only collected the data, but also assessed the data by given aspects. And these data are presented in an interactive uh, map, which is also available from the project website so you can visit it 
if you are interested. interested. Uh, from now on, I would like to speak about the results of the laboratory experiments. First of all, the metal leaching. Here you can see this figure illustrates the concept. The concept of the enhanced metal leaching in geothermal systems. So we have a fracture or fractured or enrichment introduce the cool uh, fluid with some reactants and uh, sorry I lost the laser pointer it's it's here and uh, and if this fluid will dissolve minerals from here and uh, meanwhile it heats up this will uh, the this solution process will increase permeability and uh, in the outcoming hot fluid the we will have the mm, dissolved matters this uh, these leaching tests were carried out on about 15 samples. These samples were also from the selected from the potential pilot sites. First, the geological setting and the mineralogical composition of the samples uh, was identified. And then uh, uh, leaching tests were carried out at two partners. At BGS, uh, these were high pressure, high temperature batch experiments. While at University of Szeged, there were flow through experiments. Here you can see the parameters, conditions for the uh, for, for these experiments. And uh, as for University of Sayed, they built up a specific, they created this instrument, which is able to work until 40 megapascal pressure. And they applied 300 bar. Three, uh, three, finally, 300 bar pressure and, and three, 300 uh, Celsius uh, temperature. The results are quite promising. Uh, at BGS, uh, the best performing fluids were the dilute EDTA. SDS and acetic acid. And uh, they reached quite a high amount of components. Not only these matters, which are illustrated here, I don't know if it is visible or not. So this is for EDTA, this is SDS. And uh, this is the ionized water, acidic, acetic acid for this. So not only these matters, but also uh, a significant amount of components were dissolved from silicate minerals, which indicates again that the permeability really uh, is really increased during this uh, leaching process. From this work package, we have four studies, four reports, only two is illustrated here. This uh, report is uh, on, the, on, on the metal mobilization, leaching. This is a 62 pages report, but with, with a very extensive appendices. Uh, this other report uh, contains the results of another kind of uh, 
uh, other kind of experiments. Actually, these experiments were uh, were made at Vito, uh, the partner in Belgium, and they examined the role of nanocarbon particles in matter absorption, which can help the leaching process. And uh, they used functionalized nanoparticles, meaning that they found that the size of the nanoparticles, if, if, we, sel if we select different size, um, nanoparticles of different size, they will absorb different kinds of metals. So with the right selection of the nanoparticle size, we can select the, the matter we wish to, to absorb and, and mobilize. Uh, aren't you know, we have spoken about the, um, about the leaching. We arrived at the production well and the outcoming hot fluid, which contains the dissolved component. Uh, the first step matter recovery, high temperature, high pressure matter recovery was examined at Catholic University Leuven. And uh, the method was the electrolytic matter recovery, which is a known technology but not at this, this high pressure and high temperature they, they used. So uh, what, what was really new in these experiments, it's the pressure temperature conditions. And uh, for this reason, they had to build up a specific instrument just for this purpose. And uh, what they found, they, they focused mostly uh, on the recovery of copper, but they tried to recover also other, uh, other metals. And uh, the methodology worked. This was the main result. And they also found that it doesn't work for any kind of matters. So only a limited kinds of matters can be, uh, can be recovered by this technology. And I mentioned before that after this first matter recovery unit, the fluid goes for the utilization in electricity production and heating. When it comes back, it arrives uh, at the second matter recovery unit. And uh, uh, this is the so-called uh, gas diffusion electro precipitation or electrocrystallization at low pressure, low temperature. Uh, in this figure, this uh, in this compartment, uh, this is the this is a platinum anode. And in this compartment, we have the fluid itself. In the blue part, we have an oxidizing gas. Uh, in the geothermal fluid, there uh, are steel dissolved matters. The gas can get through this, uh, uh, this gas diffusion layer and oxidize the matter ions in the fluid and the oxidized matter ions were precipitated in this uh, porous on this porous medium uh, which is uh, nanocarbon nanocarbon particles so in in form of oxides or hydroxides or on any kind of complex form some of them are market ready. I can't remember exactly, but if I remember well, for example, this calcium iron oxide is a market ready product. product. Uh, uh, this uh, graph shows the results uh, of 
recovery of metals from geothermal brines from Romania, you see that it's quite effective. The, the strontium, for example, can be recovered completely. And uh, barium, zinc, manganese, a lot of metals. So very good. And this is uh, really a very worked out and refined technology. So maybe the, the highest T, T, uh, TRL level technology in the whole process. When, uh, when it comes out from, from this second metal recovery unit, the fluid goes to this additional power generation unit, which is based on a salinity gradient. Probably many of you are familiar with that, but just very shortly, uh, this uh, the technology is based on uh, the salinity difference between two fluids. Uh, if if we have a more salty fluid and a less salty fluid, and they meet at a semi-permeable membrane, the less salty fluid can go through but not the higher salinity fluid, this will result a pressure increase in the higher salinity unit. And this pressure increase can be used to move a turbine. And this is how electricity can generate it. So uh, actually, you can see that uh, uh, the technology is not as simple as I tried to explain, but this is, this is the base. And, and there, uh, there is a pilot plant in Norway of, of this kind, but they use uh, seawater and fresh water. And here, in our case, it's, it is an important finding that the temperature counts because increased temperature means higher power generation. So at 40 temperature, we had have, we have really good results. Three reports from this work package, two about the high pressure, high temperature, low pressure temperature, metal recovery, and one from this uh, additional power generation. Uh, if, if I count well, I still have five minutes. Am I correct? Okay, I'm trying to finish. Uh, so uh, we, we, I, I have spoken different technological steps and units, but all of these had to be included and integrated into one system. This was the task uh, which was coordinated by Iceland Geosurvey and they created a mathematical model for that. Uh, the, mathematical, the mathematical model included component models because, sorry, I forgot to mention this. Uh, for this, we had to, to do something first. First, we identified the main technological components. I already spoke about that. The leaching, production well, first step metal recovery, heat and electricity utilization, second step metal recovery, salt gradient power generation injection. Right? These are the main technological components. And for each component, we defined the design parameters. These this was the base for the creation of the mathematical model. Why and, and what uh, can this uh, be used for? Uh, for example, if there is a site owner or a company who wants to uh, develop a CHP plant, they can introduce their data and they will see if it is verse to establish a plant like that or not. So outcome from each component serves as input to another component. Uh, but 
we have to admit that the mathematical, mathematical model still have some weaknesses. First is that in our project, the technological components were at different TRL. I don't know if you are all familiar with TRL. So technology readiness level, nine step scale. The one is the basic concept and the nine is the commercial market ready product. So you could see from my report that, that the different technological units were not on the same TRL level, which makes a mathematical model problematic, the creation of the mathematical model problematic. And uh, the other problem is was that the component models represented different levels of complexity. And we also face the problem uh, that if we want to refine this mathematical model, shall we move from a very simple case towards the more complex case or just the opposite? Shall we start from a site specific complex scenario and move towards the general CHP endpoint? So it needs really further thinking. Uh, three reports again from this work package. And, uh, oh, sorry. And uh, meanwhile, parallel with this examination, we carried out a complex assessment, sustainability assessment, uh, which considered economic, policy, environmental, and ethic, ethical aspects. Uh, again, five reports from this work. Then from the very beginning, we were thinking about the time horizon, the time frame. When we started the project in 2016, the EGS technology already existed. And uh, the project lasted for three and a half years ended in uh, 2019. And according to our plans, the pilot operation would be possible by 2030 and the uh, complete industrial operation by at industrial scale would be possible by 2050. Of course, this is not as simple as that. So we uh, created a research map and tried to identify all necessary uh, measures and conditions which are needed to reach this goal. Uh, we made a horizon scanning. I mean, uh, detailed literature research and orientation workshops, and we involved experts, quite a large number, I don't remember exactly, experts from the mining industry and from the geothermal sectors. These experts also participated in a Delphi survey, and we studied in details the study area reports. Uh, and uh, this is where how the milestones were identified, the milestones and the needed uh, actions uh, in this on this time scale, and this is how we created this roadmap. Uh, there are three reports from this work. I would like to emphasize the role of this report. This is what I mentioned before. This report is compiled of, uh, compiled of five reports I mentioned before. Cornwall, um, Neves Corbo, uh, um, Bayus Basin, and the two sites in, in uh, Sweden plus the European outlook. So it's a, 
It's more than 900 pages report with huge amount of information and details and also available from the project website. Oh, sorry. And uh, shortly, the conclusions. So you could see that this project CHP in 2030 was a low TR uh, project. We promised a proof of concept only at love scale. Uh, some technology components were developed in lab scale, while other components almost ready, uh, almost full scale. There were parallel activities uh, of the technology development and the whole system dynamic modeling, which is a special feature of the project. And as I mentioned before, that the full loop con uh, concept was not achieved because we didn't consider the heating and, and electricity utilization. It was out of scope and out of our exper expertise. So that was all from my side. And thank you very much for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Eva. That was excellent. I'm reminded of all the all the work that went into it. I'd put it, put it to the back of my mind. At this some point. details you could you could report better better mm, than me. I'm not sure. Especially <laughs> the metal leaching. Maybe maybe. I, there's definitely some people on the call who will be able to answer those questions. Anyway, that's for mm. sure. Um, so we have questions beginning to come through. Um, Hannah, would you be happy if I unmute you to ask your question or unmute yourself? Pardon? Would you, uh, are you happy to ask your question, Hannah? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Eva. Okay. Thanks very much for your, for your talk. That was really interesting. Thank you. So um, my question is concerning metal deposition within the actual system. Um, so the metals that are leached, potentially leached from depth. So my background is I've done some work on sulfide scaling on geothermal wells in Iceland, um, where they get really clogged up and they are actually blocked, for example, um, like on Reykjanes. And my question is um, your views on how um, in the sites that you're looking at, like the pilot sites, is this likely to be a metal loss at depth? Um, is it likely to, to be a problem of losing metal at depth within the pipes? Yes, uh, this was a question we, which we discussed several times with, within, the, within the partnership. And I, I just, come up with, this, with the same explanation that we try to find out things at large scale. So when, when we speak about scaling, we are at industrial scale, so yes. in operation. Yeah. So it was not in focus how to avoid scaling in, in our system. I don't know if, if this was a question. Yep, yep, no, it is. I was just, uh, obviously, you've thought about it. It was just uh, coming from my background with the, um, how much it had been discussed. Yeah, and, and, and even <laughs> we, we had a, an expert in the consortium, Vigdis, Vigdis Hadadoti. She's a coach. She was a co-supervisor of my PhD. Yeah, work. Yes. <laughs> she was really the expert of scaling processes, but still, this this was not in focus. Okay, okay. No, thank you. That's interesting. All the same. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, are you happy to ask your question? Yes, sure. Hi, hi, Eva. Um, yeah, uh, my question is a bit around um, yeah economic feasibility on or how much metals we can actually produce from these kind of sites. Uh, I guess maybe that's a bit early to ask you because it's it's quite a lab based. Uh, study, but do you have any idea on how much metals could be produced annually, for example, or what what kind of resources are on these on these sites? Yeah, I'm just trying to to remember numbers, but I have mm. to admit, I I cannot tell you numbers for the moment. Probably, yes. uh, if if you are interested, you you will find this. You see the. Uh, website here yeah. and 
you you may find some data, but to be honest, uh, I uh, it's a bit early. Maybe. I cannot tell you any numbers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. But but as for the different steps, some of them were assessed economically. I remember mm -hmm. that uh, the, the the partners, the veto who made this uh, gas diffusion, electro precipitation, electrocrystallization, they provided economic assessment mm -hmm. and they found out that it is really economic. Mm, okay. So, I guess there's a, I mean, there's probably, even if you don't have, uh, can produce as much metals, you still have some uh, revenue from the energy production as well. So I guess that's a quite an interesting combination. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. In, in this economic assessment, I showed you the, the report on this. You may find data about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a look. Great. Thank you, Stefan. Um, Chris, if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, there's a question there. Hello, am I coming through? You are loud and clear. Sorry, I've got terrible, terrible reception. Okay. Um, yeah, so Eva, hi. Um, hi, nice hi, to nice, see you. Nice to see you again. Um, I haven't seen you since the project ended. I know, it was, it was a lovely, lovely meeting, the lovely final meeting in the show. That was fantastic. Um, quick question, uh, how do you see this going in the future? What opportunities do we have in the future? You know, the Draft Horizon Europe calls out and metals and there's geothermal mentioned there. Um, what comments have you got about how we can take this forward? Uh, to in, not, you know, not just some of the metals we looked at in CHPM 2030, but let's say maybe more novel metals like rubidium and other things like that for green systems. I mean, there's a lot we can get out of these sort of fluids with geothermal. What are your thoughts for the future? Yes, but the first point is that we have to have some fund. So yes. uh, <laughs> a new proposal should be prepared and submitted because we need the fund. And I think that the best way would be to focus on recovery of specific matters, not matter recovery in general what we did in, in this project. So we should find out according to the needs. It's, it should be lithium. We actually, we, we didn't focus on lithium at all in our project, but could be a target or, or any other, other um, matters uh, because it changes so fast. I mean, the, the market need uh, changes so so fast. So two things, having new projects and uh, we, we see, we really see interest because uh, we, we received inquiries about that, about the potential partnership. You know that, Chris? Yeah. The, we, we are also some of the partners who were partners in the CHPM project uh, are partners in another geothermal project, Reflect, but uh, this Reflect, uh, the matter recovery is not a point in, in this uh, Reflect project. But some of the Reflect partners expressed their interest in the involvement in a new project. So getting fund first, then focusing on one or two or a few matters, not matters in general. And from an industrial side, um, uh, and so sort of the companies that might be interested in, in those metals, I mean, do you, do you get any information from them, how interested they are in the, sort of the technologies involved? In, in, in talking what, to these what company companies. you mean? Sort of, so, so metal companies or geothermal companies have, since the end of CHPM 2030, has there been kind of industrial interest in the outcomes of the project to take it forward? Yes, but uh, we, we have no 
a specific company who would be interested for the moment. We rather look for potential pilot sites. You know that yes, Cornwall yeah, yeah, yeah. would be the best yeah. option. I think that Cornwall would be the best option. But uh, as uh, for from the from the Reflect project, uh, this uh, and other ideas also emerged that there could be other uh, potential uh, test sites, pilot site. In my opinion, Cornwall would be the perfect site. I would like it to be Cornwall as well, and I'm trying my best. <laughs> We'd all like it to be Cornwall, I think. <laughs> Thank you very um, much. No, thank you, Chris. Eva, I was going to ask how, I don't know if you know this, how much does it cost to build a pilot plant? Are they, like, do we have an idea of the, I know, the you economics of a, of a pilot so plant. difficult question. Sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know if any, anyone from the audience could, could tell this. Actually, I, I cannot tell you. I don't, no, no, I can't, I couldn't remember either. I, I, I don't know what, I wondered if there was, I uh, think there was an economic assessment. I have made. to admit, I should. <laughs> so <Okay>. should I. <laughs> but, but I don't know. In fact, this project, uh, this, this was a very nice experience for me, this project, because, you know, I am a geologist. Mm -hmm. But there are so different and so distant uh, areas of science, disciplines mm. involved in this project that each of the partners, I think, we had to learn a lot. Mm. It, yeah, it was very inter interdisciplinary. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Alicia, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. So on the very large scale of systems that you are talking about now. I'm going to go to nanoscale because I completely forgot, Eva, what nanoparticles were used for the leaching. Do you remember? Just out of interest. Nanocarbon. Ah, carbon. Carbon, nanocarbon particles. Mm -hmm. But it was quite theoretical, if, if mm -hmm. I can say this, this. So it was not, and, uh, and even Vito, the, uh, uh, in their experiment, uh, uh, they used, they tried only one matter. I can't remember right. exactly. So it was not too complex. It was just okay. only a side sure. part uh, in the project, but very interesting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very new and, and innovative. Absolutely. Excellent. I, I, I just wondered um, about the Cornish example. Is it sort of beneficial? It, would it be beneficial to have this pine dot plant there because there is already infrastructure in place, partially in place for the geothermal um, energy extraction? So I guess building a plant for metal recovery on top of that, mm. that could be maybe financially. Yeah, and, um, and they also expressed their interest in, in cooperation. So it would be really nice. I see Chris has added an answer. Uh, Vito looked at neodymium with carbon nanoparticles. Ah, thank you, Chris. <laughs> I should remember that as well. Yes, because it was, uh, Chris uh, led this work package, this leading, leaching work. Oh, right. Of course, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Just a, <clears throat> excuse me, a final point there from Chris is that in Cornwall, the, the um, Cornish lithium are looking to put in um, a lithium extraction plant and that will be formed at, at a predicted cost of four million pounds. So they're not cheap, but, mm. you know, compared to building a mine, mm. consider, considerably cheaper than, than developing a mine. And uh, mm -hmm. you know if if they have the the lithium content that they can extract. Um, I think that comes to the end of our questions, Eva. Um, I don't think anyone else has posted anything. 
Um, so I'd just like to thank you so much for coming along. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, that was a great talk. And it was so nice to, so nice to hear all about the, the final, final results of Chimps as well. Um, so I think everyone, on, uh, if you, you're welcome to leave at any point and we'll be ending the meeting shortly. So thank you all very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.